All right. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to those of you who are on the East Coast. And welcome to our first uh, fall webinar uh, with the Community College Consortium for OER. Uh, this is Una Daly, the Director of the Community College Consortium. And it's our pleasure to um, be presenting on finding and adopting open educational resources this morning. And um, as you can see, we have a stellar cast of uh, speakers here this morning. We have Kate McGee from Canvas Commons, Nicole Finkbeiner from OpenStax College, and Tanner Huggins from the Sailor Academy. For those of you who might be new to the uh, Collaborate, the Blackboard Collaborate system, um, the things to be aware of are on your left-hand side you'll see a participants list window. You should see yourself in there. You might have to scroll down. And directly underneath that you're going to see a chat window. And um, we welcome you using that chat window uh, throughout the webinar um, to share comments and questions. Um, at the end of the webinar we'll have a, an open time for questions where you can use your microphone. But uh, we ask that you keep your microphone off during uh, the webinar just to support uh, the recording, the clarity of the recording. So, um, and we do want to thank the California Community College System that lets us uh, broadcast on their Collaborate system for these open educational uh, webinars. Here's our agenda. Um, we're going to get a chance to meet our speakers uh, just here in a moment, and then we're going to have a very quick overview on CCC OER and a little bit about OER, and then we're going to get we're going to jump right into our presentations and then hold our Q and A for the last ten minutes. All right. Uh, while um, our our speakers are introducing themselves, I want to. Um, invite you, our audience, to uh, type in the chat window. Uh, let us know who you are, uh, what college or organization you're with, and um, anything else about the work that you do there related to OER. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Kate McGee. She is the Canvas Commons Product Manager at Instructure Canvas. Uh, Kate, tell us a little bit about your day job there. Yeah, hello. Um, so as the product manager for Commons, um, I get to work with all aspects of what happens inside of Commons. So that means that I get to conduct uh, user interviews where I go out and um, meet with uh, institutions and go do visits. Um, uh, recently we got to go talk with Tacoma Community College or Seattle University. Um, and when we, do, when we go there, we speak with uh, instructors and admins and uh, designers and, and learn about how they're creating content and how they're looking to share that content. Um, as well as look at how we're going to uh, build out the features for the product and then continue to um, do user testing to improve the overall product. Great, great. Well, thank you, Kate. We're, we're really happy to have you with us this morning. Um, next up is Nicole Steiner. Uh, she's the Associate Director of Institutional Relations at OpenStax College. So Nicole, tell us about all the great work you're doing at OpenStax. Well, at least some of it. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. This is Nicole Finkbeiner. I'm the Associate Director of Institutional Relations at OpenStax College, formerly a community college administrator. So I feel very at home right now. And my main role at OpenStax College is to provide free consultation to institutional um, partners that we have, so colleges and universities that want to form a partnership with us to support any efforts around OER adoption, including OpenStax college materials, but actually including all OER material. Great. Um, thank you, Nicole. And, um, Finally, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Tanner Huggins, who is the Education Project Manager at Sailor Academy. Tanner? Hi, Una. Hi, everyone. Uh, that's right. My name is Tanner Huggins. I'm with Sailor Academy. I'm the Education Project Manager. Uh, what that means is on a day-to-day -day basis, I work with our professors and peer reviewers to develop and maintain our suite of Sailor courses. And then I'm also working on the back end to help make improvements for the student experience, uh, answer student questions, and kind of collaborate with everyone here. We're a really small team, so we all wear a lot of hats, but it's a lot of fun. We all get to do a little bit of everything. All right. Well, thank you, Tanner. And we're looking forward to hearing more about that in a minute. 
All right. For those of you who this might be the first webinar you're attending with us, um, the Community College Consortium for OER is a consortium of community colleges uh, throughout North America. And our focus is expanding access to high quality open materials. Um, we support faculty choice and development around curriculum. And of course this webinar is part of that faculty development that we offer to our community college members. And um, at the heart of it is improving student success. So we want to expand access for students and give them choices as well so that they can be successful in their academic um, endeavors. We represent over 250 colleges in 21 states and provinces. And if your uh, college isn't on that map, we'd love to talk to you about that. So um, there may be some of you here today because we certainly did advertise this as a good webinar to um, hear about an introduction to open educational resources as well as for more experienced folks. So I wanted to give you the basic definition. Um, and this is actually comes from the Hewlett Foundation uh, who is a, a large supporter of OER and a longtime supporter of, of open education. Um, and this definition is also very similar to the one that the U.S. State Department uses. So it's teaching, learning, and research resources that are released under an intellectual property license or are in the public domain which permits their free use and repurposing by others. And so some examples of that are videos, um, courses uh, such as uh, are available from OpenCourseWare from Lumen, open textbooks, um, and just in general uh, lesson plans, documents, etc. And for most um, purposes, when we talk about that intellectual property license, we're talking about Creative Commons. So that's the Creative Commons license. And one thing that often brings people in initially is the cost savings that can be achieved by using open educational resources instead of, say, a traditional um, publisher textbook. And here we have an example of an introductory statistics book uh, that is published by OpenStax, uh, which of course is, uh, is being represented today. Um, all of their textbooks have a Creative Commons license, which means that they're available for digital access for free to students and faculty. A hard copy can be purchased for a fairly modest fee. Um, the um, equivalent textbook uh, for an introductory statistics course from a publisher is running about $150 at the college bookstore. Um, this is from a traditional publisher, publishing house um, with an all rights reserved copyright on it. So it can make a huge difference in terms of access for students and when colleges look at that for over all of their students and over the courses where there are um, excellent open textbooks available, the cost savings can be really quite significant. All right. Um, I'm sorry that was a very quick introduction to OER, but now we're going to hear from some of the people who are out there um, making it possible for us at the colleges to adopt uh, these wonderful resources and uh, provide these kind of cost savings for our students. And so I'm now going to turn the mic over to Kate McGee to tell us about Canvas Commons, which is a wonderful OER repository. It's just about one year old now, um, but it is growing and um, she's going to tell us about how uh, all faculty can get a free teacher account there um, and can access and upload um, open educational resources as, um, as desired. So Kate? All right, hello. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk with you about Commons and, and in addition how you can um, demo Commons and, and potentially start using it for your own use, but also talk about how Commons can um, help you generate ideas, help you, um, you know, save time by building off of other people's work and also contributing to the community that we're building there. Um, if you are tweeting or anything, just wanted to let you know uh, my handle as well as the hashtag if you're wanting to uh, mention anything or if uh, you, you want to follow what Canvas Commons is doing. So, 
Um, so first I want to kind of just talk about uh, how comments can help you um, reduce the amount of work that you are currently doing to create work. So since comments has, uh, an, you know, it's open and it allows for you to go in there and find what other uh, instructors with your same specialty are doing, it allows you to kind of get ideas. So as opposed to having to come up with something from scratch, um, you have the ability to uh, learn from others as well as be able to um, think about reusing something that someone has already used. So the hope there is, is that, you know, you're getting to spend time focusing on your students, getting time to focus on, your, on um, teaching as opposed to always having to create new curriculum. Um, this is kind of a quick preview of what Commons looks like. Uh, Commons is right now is uh, available uh, inside of Canvas. And um, we, uh, we, we launched out of, we launched into beta last October and released out of beta just this June. And since then, we've seen a 75% adoption by Canvas uh, current customers. And, uh, and over 1,400 resources already uh, shared into our public repository that we have, um, where anybody can access uh, a course or something. And here you can see what different resources we have. So um, it's what we've heard is just really positive feedback on the ability to actually share quizzes um, that are in the digital format. Um, we support Common Cartridge, which is a standard that's uh, supported by IMS. Um, so these are, so there is the ability to export these and be able to take them to other LMSs. Um, but in addition to that, you know, being able to have videos and images and audio files and documents like you would normally see in a repository, but also getting, you know, lesson plans in the form of modules and things like that. Um, and so I have a couple challenges for you. And uh, my first one today is to uh, encourage you to go check out Commons. Um, you can access it by going to this URL here, this bit.ly uh, bit slash try comments. And if you click on build it, um, you'll be presented with a sign up form. And then you'll be able to enter into a sandbox in which you'll see comments in the top navigation there. Um, and you know, this will be a great opportunity for you to be able to see uh, what resources are available uh, for public consumption as well as be able to contribute your own things that you've made. Um, and we're excited to see those added as well. Um, Commons is also a great opportunity to, uh, you know, as we talked about, as I talked about before and mentioned, uh, reuse content that's already been uh, made. So uh, you can look at how, how someone in your department or someone that you, is your peer is making things and being able to share that. So, when you are sharing in, in Commons, you have the ability to share with yourself, which is this center circle. Um, you have the ability to share within your Canvas account, um, as well as the sub accounts there, as well as publicly. So that allows, if, if uh, you're teaching in a Spanish lesson, and um, you hear from one of your peers that they've you know, just done a great activity in which they saw a lot of student engagement, they can quickly share that assignment with you, and you can pull it into your course and be able to um, start that activity, you know, within the same day um, without a lot of overhead on your part. Um, Commons is also a really great way for you to share templates in master courses. Um, Commons has the ability to update resources. So if I share out um, that Spanish activity and I realize that uh, in addition to it, there's a worksheet that I like to send home with my students, uh, I can add that into the resource that I'm sharing. And the teacher who, sh who uh, used it in their class um, will get receive an update. And they'll be notified that inside of Canvas uh, if, and inside of Commons if they would like to uh, update that resource to be able to include the additional worksheet. Um, or they can dismiss it if they want to. Um, when you're sharing, one thing to keep in mind is, is that uh, Commons supports all of the Creative Commons licenses that uh, Una mentioned earlier. Um, we also support the ability for um, to upload copyrighted material, so, but with the specifications of who can use it and when, um, as well as uh, the ability to make things public domain. Um, 
So lots of support for the different types of licensing that's available and helping to support the open education community and being able to um, take these resources and remix and reuse. Um, so my second challenge for you is, is that um, if you're considering Commons, uh, we have a couple resources in which you could uh, download and try out and consider uh, setting up a training, uh, training session at your institution if you have campus or not. Um, look at how Commons could be supportive of your internal sharing needs. Um, if you do happen to go on to Commons, um, Erica Ellis shared some really great uh, modules on content sharing and licensing as well as getting started with Canvas Commons. So these are great uh, modules that you can bring into your course, uh, into a uh, PD course, and uh, prepare people to be using Commons in your institution. And the last thing I really have to talk about is, uh, you know, continuing to use Commons. Um, Commons only gets better by people continuing to share into it as well as use it. So um, we really are excited to have a lot of uh, subject matter experts be able to add to Commons. It's, it's a great place for uh, professors and instructors to be able to show off their expertise and to contribute to their community in that way. So the last thing I really want to challenge you with is uh, consider sharing something in the comments and, and kind of see the community's response to it and see how uh, adding your own um, experience to that community can be beneficial for others. Um, as we're, you know, as we're kind of just barely out of beta, we're really looking to uh, strengthen the feature set of comments and make it better. We have a very active community. Um, that you can access and see what's going on at commons.canvaslms.com. Um, if you are on Canvas or things like that, we would love to hear your feedback and hear any questions. Even if you're not, if there's questions that you have, we're very happy to answer those. Um, again, if you're interested in trying Commons, um, uh, you can access it through this URL and click on Build It. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for your uh, for having me here today, and I'm very excited to get to share. I've gotten to share something I'm so passionate about, which is making it possible for teachers to be able to share with each other and being able to build better resources for students to actually be engaged and and, and have better outcomes. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. And since your presentation was a uh, little under the 15 minutes that we allowed you, I think we'll just take a couple of questions before we move on to Nicole, because um, I think these were good questions. Um, one person asked about the licensing, um, and you, you did mention that after they posted the question. So do you want to give a little bit more information about the licensing? And someone else asked, can people download materials from there, and how do they know that they can reuse the materials that they've downloaded? Yeah, um, so uh, just talking about the licensing. Uh, so when you share a resource, you have the ability to uh, add a license to it that says uh, either choose any of the six Creative Commons licenses. Um, as well as uh, the ability to add specifications to any of the licenses that exist. Um, the Creative Commons ones are great so that they, you know, they're a really great base for um, whether you want attributions or non-commercial use or no derivatives. Um, and if there's any specifications, we have a field in which um, users can enter all that information in. Um, as well as when somebody's searching, they're going to be able to see the license that you've shared uh, your resource with. So they're going to be able to see that it's a, um, a Creative Commons uh, just attribution. And then, um, you know, it's relying on the user to uh, bring that into wherever they're using that resource to make sure that the right attribution is being given. Um, so, uh, and then if we're going to talk about uh, downloading. So if you access comments uh, right now, you can download uh, videos, images, um, documents, and audio files. Um, right now, we don't have a great way for you to necessarily download a comp the common cartridge file, but 
think that's something that we're looking forward to exploring. But you can get some of those, any of those common file formats um, to download and to be able to use wherever you're looking to use. And um, just trying to think about. So, and then again, uh, the user will be able to see what kind of license is there, so they'll they'll know kind of in which in which way they should appropriately use that resource. Um, you know, and then, I, I, yeah, sorry. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I saw a question here about um, the the two weeks free. Um, as I as I understand, you can kind of use the Commons. Uh, if you use the Build It Teacher Class on Common on Canvas for free for forever, you should be able to use. Uh, that Canvas sand, what we call a Canvas sandbox, for as long as you would, as you would like to get access to it, and there, there's no cost um, as long as you're using the, um, not the Try It Test account, but the Build It account. Okay. There, there was another question about um, accessing materials. Um, if let's say you're using a different LMS, your college uses a different LMS. Can you link directly to Canvas Commons to bring materials into your courses on a different LMS, or do you need to download? Um, yeah, so if you're in another LMS, uh, right now we don't have any integrations built with other L uh, we don't have any integrations built with any other LMSs at this time. Um, so you would need to export that and then upload it into Commons to be able to share it. Whereas in Canvas, you, you, there within the gear icon that we have uh, on any object, you can share it directly into a common. So slightly different experience there. All right. Um, so um, Kate, I'm going to let you take a look at the chat window because you've had some more specific mm -hmm. questions that come in around licensing, and I'll let you answer those in the chat window so that we okay. can move on with the webinar. And we, will, um, we can come back to those at the end. So thank you, everyone. Um, great questions for Kate about Canvas Commons. All right. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Nicole from OpenStax College. And we've been presenting with uh, OpenStax College uh, and Nicole uh, for, geez, about three years now. Um, and um, their group, uh, their collection of open textbooks has grown from uh, back when it was just sociology and physics about three years ago to over 17 open textbooks now. And I know Nicole is going to give us an update on that and uh, perhaps uh, to hear more about additional open textbooks that will be available in the future. Nicole? Thank you so much, Una, and thank you to everyone for coming today. And finally, thank you to the Open Education Consortium for having me today. So um, I'm Nicole Finkbeiner, and again, I'm the Associate Director of Institutional Relations for Open Stacks College, which means that I act as a free consultant uh, to colleges and universities that, to work on implementing open educational resources. All right. Uh, so one of the big questions that we get and we always like to answer is, how are we funded? Uh, well, the development of new textbooks is primarily funded by foundation support. And we definitely always like to thank our supporting foundations that you see on the screen today. We do also have a sustainability model. And if you all are interested, I can go into that later. Um, that does allow us to continue the books if we lost all of our funding. We just wouldn't be able to develop new books, but we'd be able to do new editions. But the development of the new books are absolutely supported by these foundations. So we have been working in open educational resources at Rice University since 1999. And um, we're the first to admit that uh, when we first started working on them, they weren't the greatest thing that we were putting out there and that others were putting out there. Um, it was hard to find them. They were difficult to use. You weren't quite sure who wrote them. So when we formed OpenStax College, which is still a part of Rice, uh, we decided on these four key tenets that would drive our work. Number one, we're going to make it easy to find and use the materials. Two, free is not enough. So our development model for our textbook looks pretty much exactly like a publisher model. We hire authors and reviewers to write and review our content, and we put it through a very strict editorial process. 
before publishing it online for free. We ensure that our books meet the standard scope and sequence to support existing curricula and to support our faculty to ensure an easy transition. And then we partner with uh, essential learning resources uh, such as online homework providers that can enhance the content of the textbooks. So as Una mentioned, we've grown quite a bit. And uh, so these are the textbooks we currently have out. Um, our goal is 25 textbooks by the end of 2016, which as you can imagine is a very aggressive goal. Um, I would like to point out that we have published our second edition of sociology. And this was uh, funded completely by sustainability funds. So that is proof of concept, concept there. And then we've also published uh, three AP versions of our textbooks, physics, macroeconomics, and microeconomics, um, because we did see such significant need there. So one of the big questions that I get is, Nicole, how are you all choosing the books that you're choosing to publish? And there are a lot of criteria that go into that. Um, but primarily, there's two main criteria. Number one, how many students are taking the course nationwide? We know that there are a million students a year taking US history, and a million students a year taking psychology. There are about 500,000 students a year taking one of the biology books. Um, so it's a significant number. The second thing is, how expensive is the textbook currently in the market? So there are some high enrollment courses where the average textbook cost is $40, which is pretty reasonable. But it's not uncommon for a physics book to be $350 or a psychology book to be $200. I find it ironic, but economics is one of the most expensive textbooks you can buy. So who's using our resources? Well, we have seen tremendous growth. Uh, we're up above 2,200 adoptions of our books at over 1,400 schools. Um, most of them are the US. We do see some international adoptions as well. But this just gives you an idea of the wide variety of colleges and universities that are adopting open science college books. And then we also have our institutional partnership program, which are the, the community colleges and, and four-year schools that I work specifically with to consult on uh, promoting OER. And these are some of our partner and affiliated schools. Um, so, and then there's also a second slide of them as well because it's growing so significantly. So one of the big things uh, is how do you access these books and what formats are they in? Well, the number one selling point that we find for faculty is that all students have access on day one of their class. Um, so there's no registration or sign up required for students. They have immediate access. So they can go online, click on the PDF, and download it without any sign-ins or anything. So they can do it while they're sitting in class going over the syllabus or whatever. The same way with the web, web view. They can read it live on the web from any device that has internet access at any time. And it is a responsive design. And the students have immediate access. So we know that on the first day of class, it depends on the survey you read, somewhere between 65 and 80% of the students are sitting there without the required materials for the course. And this is really frustrating for faculty members who are trying to meet all of their learning objectives and move the course forward in an effective way. So this instant access is a big deal. So as I mentioned, the PDF and the web view are completely free. There's no limitations on those. Uh, you can download them as many times as you need to if you're like me and continually forget where you save things on your computer. Um, you can also print the PDF, although I don't necessarily recommend that because printer ink is expensive. The Bookshare versions for students with disabilities are also free. And then we do offer, for the majority of our books, two premium options. The first one is print. We find that approximately 10% of students still want to purchase a printed copy of the books. Um, so we do offer those, and we sell those basically at cost. So the books range anywhere from $29 to $60, depending on basically the thickness of the book. The students can buy those through the bookstore, which is great if they have financial aid and such, or they can buy them directly via Amazon. The other option is a premium interactive iBook version of our textbooks. It's $4.99. Students really like those because once they download it to their tablet or their iPad, then they always have access to it without internet access. 
It's highly interactive. They can quiz themselves on it, do different simulations in that as well. But again, the two paid options are completely optional. The students can go onto our website, immediately click, and have access to the free versions of the book. We also offer additional supplemental resources around our textbooks. We find these are absolutely crucial um, for faculty to be able to teach in the way that they would like to. So we offer online homework from partners. So how it works is that we have partnered with a wide variety of independent homework, courseware, different types of partners that you can utilize with the OpenStax College books. Now, there are several of them. So your faculty members can choose the homework provider that they think is best. For example, for our physics book, we have five or six different partners that they can choose from. And they range in price from typically about $25 to $60, so much less than a publisher homework system as well. And again, the faculty can choose which one. They're not locked into a particular one. And how it works is if a faculty member chooses to use online homework from all of our partners with the book, it is optional, then the online homework partner provides a mission support feedback to us, and that's how we support our books. Same way with online labs. And then depending on the book and the funding, um, we offer free PowerPoint slides, pronunciation guides, solution manuals, and test banks. Now, those are protected behind a faculty verification wall. We manually verify any faculty members trying to get access to those. And sometimes I get the fun job of doing that. So if you want to hear some fun stories, let me know, and I'll tell you how students have tried to get a hold of those. But they can't. But that is the only time we require a sign-in and verification. So faculty primarily use our books in one of two ways. Number one, and by far the most uh, used option is to adopt an OpenStax College book as their main textbook. So they're simply removing a publisher textbook from their course and instead choosing to use an OpenStax College book as their primary resource. The second option is to recommend an OpenStax book as an option for studying and affordability. And we see this in a wide variety of ways. Um, they will tell their students that if they can't afford the, the textbook, that they can use the OpenStax College book again instead. Or we also hear quite often um, students finding the book on their own and using it as a study aid um, because Sometimes just reading something from a different person's perspective or a different author's perspective can help the students understand those concepts. So we hear about that a lot as well. So I know a lot of um, people ask me to cover institutional initiatives and how they work and what is involved in implementing open educational resources at the institutional level. Number one, a great idea is to get faculty pilots. And I find that this works best if you, um, if you go ahead and um, identify specific faculty members and go directly to them. So oh, I just want to let everybody know, if you're on your phone, please go ahead and silence your phone. We are I'm hearing, seeing a lot in the chat button about the feedback. OK. So a faculty pilot, if, what I find is that if you go to an entire department and ask someone to pilot, typically you won't find, no one wants to raise their hand. If you go to a specific faculty member, uh, they're usually more than willing to pilot for you. Faculty support is absolutely critical. I know we have some instructional designers and librarians on the call today. And you all are absolutely instrumental in supporting faculty in transitioning to open educational resources, integrating it into LMS, uploading the test banks into your LMS, finding additional resources and videos and things that the faculty member needs, all those things uh, you provide for them. And then we also encourage incentives. And uh, we believe heavily in academic freedom at Rice University, so we do not promote mandates. Um, so institutional adoption grants are great. Institutional grants to review textbooks are great. And I particularly um, get excited when I see student organizations, such as the Student Government Association, offering grants. And I know Quill West is on this call, and uh, she can tell you more about that if you're interested. Some other things that I find are very helpful are, number one, express support from administration. Uh, so one of the things that we hear from time to time is that faculty are concerned um, that their colleges
All guests have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Okay, there. I should be back. Let me know if I'm not. Um, okay. So it, what we thought, well, your bookstores don't make that much money off textbooks. Actually, they make the majority of their money off of merchandise. So that's not necessarily the case. But what we find is that apprehension is still out there. So what I recommend is that a senior level administrator send out an email just expressing support of, of OER. And if you would like to see some samples of that, I'd be more than happy to share some of those with you. Just email me, and I'd be happy to do that. Um, but I do find that that's really helpful. Probably not my most popular suggestion, but an idea is to incorporate uh, OER and other you know, more um, contemporary instructional solutions into evaluations and tenure. Also, OER training days and webinars. So we do a lot of webinars through OpenStax College, and we find that those are very effective in promoting adoption. And we call faculty members who actively promote OER as textbook heroes. And we have a lot of those, thankfully. And we find that if you can get your textbook heroes to present at your OER training days and webinars, that those go very well. Also, don't forget to assess your current structures in terms of internet bandwidth, classroom spaces, things like that. If your students are trying to use an, an electronic resource and the classroom only has one plug in it, you might have some issues. Or if they're trying to download the book and there's some sort of firewall or something that you might run into issues. And then finally, uh, you know, one of the things that we find is that faculty honestly have no idea how much their books cost. Um, I had one department chair call me that was absolutely shocked when students came to him and said uh, that they were spending $800 for a two-semester biology course when they totaled up their book and their lab manual and their homework and such, and he had no idea. So it's really important to think of fun ways to encourage faculty to look up the cost for their, uh, of their materials for their courses. So how have we done? So since 2012, we have worked on a full-blown, peer-reviewed, peer-written college textbooks, and we have saved students $56 million. So we are very excited about this. Just this year, we will have over 250,000 students using our books nationwide. So thank you very much. I will continue to answer questions in the chat. And also put my email in the chat if you want to email me questions as well. And thank you again for your time today. Uh, thank you so much, um, Nicole, for uh, all that great information. Um, before we switch to Tanner, um, Tanner are you on the phone or are you on microphone? OK, and, and you sound great. I'm just going to switch something here, so excuse me. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, so our, our, our final speaker uh, this today is uh, Tanner Huggins from uh, the Sailor Academy. And um, Tanner is going to tell us about um, all of the great work that Sailor has been doing, um, not only with open textbooks, but open courses and uh, with other open tools. So um, we've gone from a repository to uh, the Canvas Commons to a wonderful collection of open textbooks, and now to Sailor Academy, which offers an even wider variety of materials. So Thanks, Uma. And hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing Tanner. well today. Um, a little bit of what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit about Sailor Academy. Um, we have a suite of about 100 courses right now that we're offering. Uh, all online, uh, mostly openly licensed, all for free, uh, free to access for students and institutions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those. I'll go into our course creation process, how we find materials, how we create our courses, a little bit about our users, both students and institutions, um, how you can find and use uh, OER at sailor.org, and then a little bit of a tour of the website itself, just to show you how everything works and fits together. So a little bit about sailor.org. Uh, our mission is to open education to all, and we know that open means a lot of different things. Uh, for us, it means that as much as possible, we try to have all our material be openly licensed. Uh, we like to link them to open 
certifications. So as students take our courses, they get free certificates to show that they've completed those courses. Um, open in the sense that we want to provide access to anybody who wants them. All of our courses are free. And open in that we want to encourage everybody in the community to use our materials however works for them. So if you see something in one of our courses that you like, you feel free to use it. All of our courses are openly licensed. Uh, some of the materials in them may not be, but we always indicate uh, where that's not the case. Uh, the current priorities for our courses, we're expanding our credit opportunities for students. Uh, we have a suite of courses uh, in the pipeline that are undergoing credit reviews, and we'll expect to be able to announce something about that relatively soon, and they will join our current suite of courses that have credit recommendations. Uh, as well as we're also building out partnerships with institutions and organizations to get our courses uh, in front of a wider audience. Um, so you may be asking what our courses look like and how do we create them. I'm going to show you the courses in a minute, but just to, to explain a little bit about how that looks, who builds our courses? Well, we have a team of, over the years we've accumulated maybe three to 400 uh, faculty consultants, and they're from all over the country and the world, uh, from a variety of institutions, from community colleges to IVs to two-year schools to technical schools, uh, all depending on the needs of the course. And what, what, how that works is we work with these faculty members to create an outline based on kind of the most common ways that these courses are taught um, to then, since we find and vet OER to fit into those courses, and we kind of ask the faculty to curate them in a way and create a narrative around these pieces of OER uh, that are out there that other people have created or in some cases that we create ourselves. And because we want to make sure that all of our courses are uh, easy to use, accessible, and also accurate, uh, we have a set of course and content standards. Um, so we want our faculty to get only accurate, uh, accessible, and affordable resources, and then we have all of our courses peer reviewed by other faculty. So there's a lot of people that are involved in these course creation processes. Um, but since we have a lot of eyes on them, we try to ensure that they're the best that they can be. So a little bit about our audience. Uh, our intended audience originally was students with some or no college who were looking to get credit uh, for our courses, as well as just general learners who were looking to, to brush up on something that they've forgotten. Uh, as we've expanded, we've learned a lot more about our students. Currently, we know that about 40% of our students are full-time employees and another 24% are full-time students. And they're from all walks of life, from adult learners who just need a few more credits to finish their degrees, to uh, high schoolers who are being homeschooled, to kind of everywhere in between. So we get lots of different use cases, and we try to ensure that our courses can fit a lot of different needs. And a part of that is creating credit pathways. Uh, so students can take our courses and get credit for them, and we have a few different ways that students can do that. Um, we have what we call our Sailor Direct courses, which are a suite of courses that are uh, recommended for credit by either ACE, uh, the American Council on Education, or NCCRS, the National College Credit Recommendation Service. And that means that students can take those courses with us, uh, take a proctored exam uh, for a small fee, and then they will get a transcript from us that they can give to their schools. Uh, to get credit for those. And then we also partner with other organizations through third party exams. So students can take some of our courses that have been paired up with uh, exams from uh, Excelsior's UXL, Thomas Edison's TCEP exams, um, for CLEP exams, or the AP exam. Uh, and so our courses are kind of, the content is tailored so that once a student completes our course, they should be able to jump right into those exams, pass them, and get credit for them. And this is what you all might be interested in, how educators have used our courses and what, what we can do for educators. So you can look at us as a source for vetted OER, uh, since all of our courses are created by uh, faculty members and peer reviewed by additional faculty. Um, you can see that basically everything that we've, we've drawn from all across the internet uh, kind of fits the needs of any given course. And if you want to know if a piece of OER is high quality and effective, uh, if you see it in our course, uh, that means that Lots of our faculty, as well as ourselves, have put our eyes on it and said, yeah, this is good. This uh, teaches to the learning outcomes that we have established for this course, and we can recommend it to others. Uh, and the ways that people have used our courses in the past, you can pull individual resources. Uh, like I said before, all of our content, or most of it, is openly licensed. Um, 
and in, we include tags on all of our resources to say if it is openly licensed or not. So it should be really easy to look up and see if you can use it uh, and in what ways. Um, some institutions and some uh, instructors have used our courses for textbook replacements. So say you're teaching a course and you don't want to use this expensive publisher textbook, uh, you can use our course and our suite of resources uh, as a replacement for that. Uh, we do try to, uh, as I've said before, when, when we're drawing pieces of content from all across the web, uh, we try to create a coherent narrative throughout them so you can feel comfortable in that. If we're offering a course, you'll have the same kind of linkages between the materials that you would expect uh, in, in a textbook. And then some people have also just taken our courses kind of wholesale and used everything in them and taught uh, in the classroom using our courses as a base. So that's something that we've heard of people doing and we're kind of interested to hear about how that works. So if, if you or anyone uh, at your institutions have done that, we'd love to hear about it. And uh, as I mentioned before, we also have institutional partnerships uh, with a variety of schools who have looked at our courses um, and examined them on their own end and decided that they met their standards and have told their students that, you know, if you take our courses uh, and take the Sailor exam, then come to them with the results of your exam. And if you pass, well, then there are ways that you can get credit for that directly through that institution. So that's just another way that people have used our courses. So you may be wondering, what does that actually mean? What do these courses actually look like? So I'm going to give you a little brief tour right now of how that looks for us. So I'm going to try sharing my screen here, and let's see if that works. Um, Tanner, did you want to use the tour versus the uh, screen sharing? I probably did, yes. Thank you. Okay, no worries. I apologize, everyone. Seems like it's not finding my Chrome window where I have these open. Here we go. Let's see if this works. All right. Can you all see the Sailor.org homepage right now? Um, I am not seeing it. Um, how about if we put um, how about if we put the links in the chat window that you want want them to see, and then people can uh, actually look at them on their own desktop as you speak to them? Yeah, that's Let's perfect. That. So we can do that instead. Uh, I'm sorry this doesn't work, everyone. I apologize. So if you go to our homepage, it's just sailor.org, Very simple. Um, you will see kind of uh, a little bit about our organization. Uh, we've tried to explain how our courses work, uh, and we've given them a link for students to find all of those courses. So that's just kind of a, a brief uh, overview of the organization. But the really important stuff, and what I want to show you right now, is the courses themselves. So I'm going to put a link in the chat here to this is our Business 210 course. It's a course on corporate communication. Uh, and you'll see in this course that there's a lot of different components. So, so this is the main page. When a student goes into a course, this is what they're going to see. Um, they have an introduction to the course. Uh, they can see the syllabus, which explains to them the expectations of the course, the amount of time that it's going to take, the requirements for the course, um, and kind of all the background they need. Uh, if there's a course textbook, we'll link to it here. And then we also have the terms of use uh, for the course. Um, so any resources that you may be interested in using in the course will be on this terms of use page. Uh, so you can see them there. And if you want to follow along with me, if you've gone to that link that I put in the chat, if you click on the unit one, uh, you'll be able to see the resources in the first unit of this course. And as you see, when you go into a unit, uh, we give a little bit of an introduction to what students can expect in this unit, how long it should take them, and then a set of learning outcomes for the, for the unit. So our courses all have learning outcomes on the unit level. Okay, Andrea, I see your comment. I'll slow down a little bit. Uh, all of our courses have unit outcomes on the course level as well as the unit level. So we tie those into the exams as well as the resources in the course so students understand what they're expected to know and what they can uh, be expected to be tested on at the end of the unit or the course, depending. Uh, and you can see if you're in the unit, and again, I will paste that into the chat uh, just in case no one has it. So this link I've just pasted is the first unit of our Business 210 course. And you can see it's broken down into uh, sections about uh, specific topics. So why is it important to communicate well? What is communication? And then each of the resources uh, 
in those units or in those subunits are, are there in links as well. So if you click on any of the, the resources within there, you'll be taken directly to that resource and depending on what it is, uh, a video uh, or something to read or something like that, um, you'll be told what to do. So students basically just go through our courses, uh, go through these links, and then they're able to check off when they're done and move on, and then we test them at the end of each unit. Uh, if you scroll down, you'll see the unit assessment, and assuming they pass that and feel comfortable, they'll move on to the next unit and then continue search throughout the course. So that's kind of a, a very brief uh, look into how our courses look. Um, Luna, I see that you have a question about whether or not this course has an open textbook. And yes, it does. Uh, if you go back to the course name page, you will see that there's a, a link to course textbook. And if you click on that, you'll be taken to the course textbook. Uh, in this case, the book is Business Communication for Success, uh, which we provide in various formats, HTML, PDF, and a Word document. And I'm actually going to show you all a little bit about our the other books that we offer here in a second, too. So students can download these books, use them however they would like them. They're all also openly licensed. Um, and instructors can use them as well. So if you're interested in using any of these books uh, in your own classroom, you're welcome to it. And to kind of build off of that, I'm also putting another uh, link in the chat right now, and that is to our bookshelf. And if you go to this link, you'll see a suite of about 100 books that we have either collected or created over the years. Um, all of them are freely available for download, uh, reading and sharing. They're all under open licenses, so you can use them however you would like them to, however you would like to. Um, and we offer them in as many formats as possible. Uh, wherever possible, we recommend people use them in the HTML uh, version. Uh, those are all online, hosted online, so you don't have to download them if you don't want to. Uh, you can just go to that link and everything you need will be accessible right there from your browser. But if you do want to, we also offer PDF and web doc versions of most of these books. So that's how that looks. And then another page, if you're interested in using some of our resources or in learning about more about open resources more generally, we have our uh, Open Course Resource Center, uh, which you can find at sailor.org slash open. Um, so if you go there, we talk a little bit about the licenses that we use in our courses, uh, how you can find OER, uh, how we have found OER over the years. We also have a lot of course resources guides that we've created over the years that a lot of instructors have told us have been really useful for them. Um, this is uh, links to basically all of the high quality OER that we know about uh, across a variety of topics. So when we're building out these courses, we're looking at lots of different kinds of OER and trying to see what's good and what's not. And we may have courses where there's so much good material that we just can't use it all in the course. So we put that, those kinds of things in the resource guides so maybe others who are looking for good information about a given subject can find them there. Okay, so that's kind of the basics about our, uh, our courses and our resources. Um, there's a little bit extra stuff. Uh, we do have, now we used to have a suite of about 300 courses. We've trimmed it down over time uh, to about 100. Since we're such a small staff, it's hard for us to support that many uh, in an ongoing uh, way. So all of our older courses can be found at legacy.sailor.org here on the link. Um, these are all openly licensed outlines as well. So you can check there and um, any courses that we don't currently support will be there um, with the caveat that some of them probably have broken links uh, just because we haven't been able to maintain them over the years. Um, but you can still find them there. And in the interest of being more open, we have also put all of our courses on GitHub and uh, are in repositories there. So if you want an all text version of any of our courses uh, that we don't currently support, you can find them uh, on GitHub at the link that is on this slide here. And if you're looking for something specific uh, that maybe you didn't see when you were looking through our course subjects or when you were kind of browsing the topics that we have, if you just want to do a search via Google, it should pull anything. Uh, so if you search say some specific topic, just append site colon sailor.org at the end and you should be able to see every piece of open content we have that covers that topic. Um, it's kind of a hacky way to do it, but we're, we're fans of doing things in hacky ways, so we try to figure out the, the easiest way to do it and we found that's probably the best. So if you have any other questions, um, you can feel free to email me. My email is here on the slide. Or if you have more general email or general questions, you can send them to contact at sailor.org. And if I can't answer them, somebody will. Um, so yeah, I think that's 
all I have for now, and I will look through the chat and try to answer any questions as we go along. Um, and yeah, I think we have a section of questions right. at the end, but I'll answer the rest there. All right, thanks so much, Tanner. Uh, and you do have some great questions uh, in the chat window, and uh, Jeff and Sean have been doing a good job, but I think there's a few left for you. So um, thanks to our wonderful presenters. Um, I want to let you know that our next webinar will be October 14th. Uh, they're always the second Wednesday of the month, um, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And this uh, webinar in October will be on OER and accessibility. So making those open resources accessible to all students regardless of disabilities. We have BC Campus. Amanda Coolidge will be speaking on some of the great work they've done. And we have a couple of other speakers in the pipeline which we'll let you know as we get closer. Um, so uh, at this time, I want to thank you for coming. Um, everybody's email address is here. So if you didn't get a chance to copy those down earlier, you, you can catch those here. And we are we have about we have about five minutes for questions, um, and you can either take the mic by clicking on the talk button if you want to ask a question. Um, and I know there's been so many questions, so I'll, that's an open option is to click on the mic. You can type in your question now if you would like, um, or I uh, as we're waiting for those questions to come in. <clears throat> I may ask each of our speakers to summarize uh, very quickly, like in a minute or so, uh, what were the top questions um, that they saw and um, give us answers to those. Um, so I'm going to turn this to Kate and say, Kate, um, were there any questions that, that were asked multiple times that you'd like to share the answer to one more time. Yeah, um, so uh, I think some of are just uh, wanting to try and test it out and get access. So um, there was that link that I shared earlier, um, that Bitly link. Um, and if I can find it here, I will repost it in the chat. But just that uh, it is, uh, if you sign up for one of our free for teacher accounts through the through Canvas. Uh, you can get access to Commons. Um, you will be able to download any of the documents, uh, images, videos, um, and be able to use that in any LMS. Um, if you use Canvas, you're going to get the additional um, support of full courses and modules and things like that. Uh, Una, thank you so much for posting that Bitly link. Um, so some questions around that. That's uh, entirely free to try uh, our Free for Teachers account. Um, the other thing I heard was just around um, licensing, uh, additional questions around licensing and the ability to uh, potentially have a, uh, an institution set the license. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, it's kind of up to each user who's sharing to set the license that, they would, that is appropriate. And uh, we've kind of really left that open for schools to determine their own policy. Um, but one way to kind of help uh, admins and, and schools monitor that is within Commons you have a um, resource management page which allows you to see everything that's been shared within your institution. If you have Canvas, then you have, you have Commons at that level. Um, so you can actually manage everything that is uh, um, being shared within your institution. Um, and that way, if there is any kind of issues, you can you can push it back to their personal repository and say, hey, we need to get some appropriate attributions in here before you share it, you know, more widely than it's been currently shared, um, as well as the ability to, to change any of the metadata there. Okay. Okay, great, great. Thank you for that summary, Kate, and and thanks uh, once again for presenting with us, um, Nicole. Um, I saw a couple questions in there about becoming an affiliate. Were there other questions, uh, an OpenStax affiliate, were there other questions that people uh, had, had a lot of energy around that you'd like to repeat the answer for? Sure. So yes, if you want to become an affiliate partner and talk further about that, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, that is free. And uh, just send me an email about that. The other question I saw quite often was, number one, where we publish our information about our savings and such, and that is on our opensexcollege.org news page. And I know I posted the link a couple times to the most recent publication there. Um, that is based on faculty report, voluntarily reporting into us their adoptions and numbers of students. 
Um, the other question I saw a lot was about the bookstore. And if you go to the OpenStaxCollege.org website and then go to the books page and click on the book, the main page for each textbook will have the ISBN and the, um, the publisher data that you need to go ahead and submit that to your bookstore. We are partnered with the National Association of College Stores, so your bookstore can order our textbooks just as they would any other, um, any other publisher textbook. Um, again, though, I would recommend that they order a small amount to begin with. We don't want them carrying a lot of extra stock, stock because we do find that although students say they want printed copies, when they actually have to click the buy button or go to the bookstore and buy it, it's, a, it's about 10%. All right, great. Thanks so much, uh, Nicole. Um, and finally, T uh, Tanner, do you have any uh, Sure. Uh, one like question that we got several times is how are our materials licensed? So every piece of content that we have created, which means the courses themselves, uh, the course outlines, learning outcomes, and any content that Sailor has created is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license, so CCBY 3.0, uh, which means that you can basically use it however you would like as long as you attribute um, it to us. Uh, but otherwise it's free to use for whatever purposes. Now you may want to note that some of the resources that we have are pulled from across the web so they carry a lot of different kinds of licenses. So you'll want to double check on the resources themselves uh, with, and they'll all be explained right there what, res what license those resources carry. Uh, so just double check but you should be able to use most of our resources uh, under some form of an open license. Um, that seemed like probably the biggest question, and if there's anything else uh, that anyone right. uh, wants to know, just feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, my email is right here on the slide. Okay, thanks very much, Tanner. And um, once again, a, a huge round of applause to our three wonderful presenters this morning. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And we hope to see you back here October 14th for OER and Accessibility. So have a great afternoon, everyone.